Henry, you and I have been interested, I'd say obsessed with the na nature of consciousness our whole careers. Uh, I went into neurophysiology, you're a quantum physicist. And yet, as I talk to people, it's stunning to me that some people will say that consciousness is just a hoax, an illusion, that, that our evolutionary processes played tricks on us. And yet, to most of us, consciousness seems like the most fundamental thing that we, we have. Uh, how do you view consciousness? Is it, why is it so mysterious? Well, your question kind of has two parts. One is, does consciousness do anything? And the other is, what is consciousness? And uh, I don't think... Uh, that you can go far wrong by starting with what William James says at the beginning of his book. Consciousness is ideas, thoughts, and feelings. It's the subject matter of psychology as it was understood at the turn between the 18th and 19th century. Okay. It's, a, it's the subject, the subject matter is thoughts, ideas, and feelings. <clears throat> and in fact, William James then goes on and says that feelings are somehow the fundamental thing and that your thoughts and your ideas are in fact just high-grade feelings with a lot more articulation, that feeling is the fundamental thing. And uh, so we know it by the fact that that's what our experiences are. And uh, so I don't think there's a mystery about what quantum, what uh, consciousness is. Uh, on the other hand, there is a question of does it do what we think it does? In our experience, we say, I want my arm to rise, and uh, there's a thought, and my arm rises. There seems to be a connection between your thought and your physical activities. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, the problem only then arises really in its most rigorous form when Newton came on the scene and developed a physics which only had physical variables involved. By physical variables, I mean the variables that uh, physics deals with, the locations of particles, the trajectories of particles, mm -hmm. the strength of fields, electromagnetic fields. So it's a mathematical properties that are associated with space and time. Everything mm -hmm. has a number. <laughs> yeah, it, um, in, in quantum mechanics, these numbers become something more complicated, they become actions, but nonetheless they're associated with locations and they're mathematically described. And uh, they're such that you could have laws of mathematical laws that allow them to evolve and change. And um, so from that Newtonian perspective or point of view, there was uh, no need for or no room for anything else. Everything was just mechanical mathematical properties. The classic billiard ball world. But billiard ball world or the clock... Clock... U universe. Uh, yeah. Clock universe, uh, clockwork universe. And uh, so... Every, every action has, a, has, a, has, a, has a, uh, an effect. Every effect causes is a new cause for a new effect. And one thing causes... So everything has a deterministic causal, causal completeness, that the whole system is, is, is causally complete. Yeah, not only causally complete, but causally complete in the physical realm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That means the causal completeness only deals with properties of the we just talked about, locations of particles, strengths of fields. Right. And uh, so there's nothing in that con conceptual structure that calls for these things, feelings, ideas, thoughts. The whole thing is complete in this other realm, the physical realm. So in this world, if you never had the concept of consciousness, thoughts, ideas, feelings, there'd be nothing lost within that of, context. In terms of causation, nothing would be lost because this full causal structure is already uh, completely described so in if the had, physical realm. If you had a Newtonian clockwork uh, billiard ball world and you didn't have consciousness, there's no internal contradiction. That's right. Okay. Not only there's no contradiction, but there's nothing conceptually that even calls for or hints at okay. the idea that there should be something okay. else. The full causal structure right. is... Now, some we're... people use that as part of the argument, not the total argument, to say that consciousness is, a, is an artifact, is, is an illusion, is a, an epiphenomenon, as they would say, something that we think is real, but it's not really real. That's right, and that's because they're coming from this classical perspective, this 
perspective of classical physics where the whole thing is mechanical. Mm -hmm. The whole thing is uh, in the physical realm. And there's nothing for consciousness to do. So if you want to start with that as your presumption or your bias or your, your, um, your position, then they're right. They're, there's, if there's nothing for it to do, it must be some sort of illusion. Mm -hmm. you know, if you start from classical mechanics, that's where you're inevitably driven to. I mean, the conclusion. So that's an internally consistent argument. That's that right. If you have classical mechanics in a Newtonian world, uh, uh, to say that consciousness is some kind of an illusion is in, is consistent with that world. That's right. All right. And and insofar as you've committed yourself and believe that uh, ex or accept and uh, that the world is classical, described by classical mechanics, uh, you know that's the only logical conclusion. Okay. And that's where all these people come from. So now. Now. Let's get to quantum mechanics. Well, there, even, even before you go to quantum mechanics, there are some problems with that. Okay. And that is, uh, there's a question of why are the laws what they are? In other words, the mechanical universe says, well, if you give me the initial conditions and you give me these laws, then everything else is determined, which means that uh, um, the question is, well, what determines the laws? What determines the initial conditions, mm -hmm. the initial setup? Mm -hmm. And uh, so at the time of Newton, and Isaac Newton was a religious person, he could say, well, God. God sets the thing up. He gets it up and running, determines what the laws are, sets the initial conditions. Takes care of itself. And then, in fact, not only does he allow it to take care of itself, but apparently it's got to take care of itself. He's not allowed to do anything. He's got to sit back and just either watch it happen or, or disappear from the scene. And uh, so the question is, even if you start from a classical um, point of view and you want to believe classical mechanics, and, uh, and say at the end of the 19th century, there was a lot of evidence that uh, that's how nature really did work. And, um, but there were these questions, you know, what, what were the initial, con how, you know, what's, what got the thing going? What are the laws? And, uh, and there is the uh, second puzzlement, and that is, since everything is, is this way, why was there consciousness at all? I mean, it doesn't do anything. It's just sitting there inert and uh, uh, a passive observer of the scene, which has uh, no function. So it's a mystery why, quantum, why the consciousness should ever come into to existence at all. So I have, there's two problems. They're all ready for this classical view, uh, even before we go to quantum mechanics. And uh, now, it turns out when you go to quantum mechanics, the first thing is that those laws no longer are sufficient. The quantum mechanical laws, you do have, there are four, if you really analyze it, there are four different processes in quantum mechanics. One of them, which von Neumann calls process two, people call the Schrodinger equation. One of them is a generalization of the laws of classical mechanics. Right. They're deterministic. You set the thing off and it goes on automatically according to mathematical laws. But there are three other processes that are essential. And one of them is so important that von Neumann calls it process one. That's going to be the observer. <laughs> That's the, the, the point is, the way quantum theory works, in order for, to get consequences, predictions out of quantum theory, the, uh, it works like 20 questions. A question has to be posed in the quantum mechanical scheme, and then there's this evolution according to the Schrodinger equation. Mm -hmm. And then nature gives an answer. So I've talked about three different processes already. One is the posing of the question. One is the evolution according to this mechanical, somewhat like an analogous to the laws of classical mechanics. Mm -hmm. And then nature gives an answer. Mm -hmm. Now often, uh, this, well, this answer given by nature is statistically determined. In other words, the laws of quantum mechanics say once you pose the question, and uh, you've given, you, you're given an initial condition and you pose a question, then the statistical possibility, the statistical probabilities of the answer 
yes or no are general. Let me emphasize something I didn't. These questions, according to the laws of quantum mechanics, have to be basically yes, no questions. They're not a question like, where is something? You don't ask, answer the question, where is something, by saying yes. But you can ask, is something in this region? Then you can answer yes or no. Yes or no. And so the, the way quantum mechanics works is all the, all the, before you get anything out, you've got to pose a yes, no question. And the, um, so the, the key point, the next key point is that there's nothing in quantum mechanics in these laws that determine what the question will be. So there's a gap. There's a causal gap in quantum mechanics, and the way it's filled in practice is that the observer, on the basis of his reasons or his motivations or his goals, sets up a certain experiment in a certain way. He might set up a situation where a Geiger counter or some other detector of, a, of particles is placed in some position. And then this Geiger counter will either fire or not fire, right. either yes or no. And um, so the question is, well, why did the, why did the uh, Geiger counter get placed here and not there? There's a whole continuum of places that it possibly could have gone. And um, in quantum mechanics, um, there is no law of quantum mechanics that determines what the question will be. Now, how does this bring us to consciousness? Well, the way it, and the way this question is answered in quantum mechanics, in orthodox quantum mechanics, the way it's used and taught is that the observer chooses, and the observer chooses, of course, on the basis of his reasons for doing it. So you're in, you're in this realm, the psychological realm. In other words, reasons, thinking, thoughts. That's in this other realm of of reality. And it is certainly a part of reality. We know that thoughts exist. Nobody's really denying that thoughts exist. And uh, the question was, how do they do something? And the point is, in quantum mechanics, there is a place for them to do something and a, and a need for them. Because there's nothing in the me mechanical world that determines what the question will be. In actual practice, the, the answer to this question is provided by something in this other realm, in the psychological realm. So there's a need in quantum mechanics for something else in the way it's, uh, the way quantum mechanics works in actual practice is that this something else is a choice on the part of a human being, which is a psychological process. So quantum mechanics is built in its structure to demand and both allow and demand uh, the input of psychic, psychological input into the physical region. So, um, I mean, this is beautiful, you know. It's just, it answers basically, I mean, it doesn't give you all the details of every answer, but it gives you the basic structure of understanding how consciousness can affect your, your actions, your physical actions. How then does quantum mechanics change the situation of Newtonian clockwork universe? Well, quantum mechanics does not have a complete deterministic system. In fact, if you analyze the structure of quantum mechanics, an important element is that a human being, in the way it's actually used in practice, has to ask a, a particular question. And there's no rules in the quantum mechanical system for what that question will be. So you have a, a, an essential element of indeterminacy associated with the asking of a particular question. Uh, now, what experiment am I going to do that um, comes into the quantum mechanical, which is completely unlike anything in classical mechanics. And does this therefore elevate consciousness to something of, of fundamental importance as opposed to some artifact of the, of the classical Newtonian clockwork world? Well, the, in the Newtonian picture, you have to think that this, that this consciousness either does nothing at all, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's just up there doing nothing, but here, there is a role for consciousness uh, 
it, it, it has to come in to pose a particular question that the quantum mechanical formalism then uh, supplies an answer. And by doing so, it becomes then a fundamental part of reality. It, 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 it is injected into the causal structure. We don't doubt that it's part of the, part of the world. Well, some conscious, <laughs> you know, it, it exists. I mean, certainly it exists. And, uh, and the question is, does it do anything? And the, the problem before was that it couldn't do anything. Now, there's something for it to do, and uh, the rules of quantum mechanics are built around the fact of this input of something that comes in, in, in practice out of a conscious choice.